morning. I, uh, I did just fly in from Canada. It was zero degrees when I got there, and I spoke yesterday morning, and it was minus nine. So we should be thankful that we're in this, this place, I think. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Ricketts. For the past decade, Dr. Ricketts, together with his colleagues at the Technology and Entrepreneurship Center at Harvard University, have taught the next generation of Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg's how to create disruptive innovation. Uh, David has partnered with some of the world's leading organizations, General Motors, Disney, U.S. military, to create breakthrough innovations. These innovations have been featured in ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox News, as well as uh, ESPN, the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Innovation, and Popular Science. He has held appointments at MIT, Harvard University, Carnegie Mellon, and North Carolina State University. Today, Dave is going to share his insights in how you can create disruptive innovation and accelerate innovation in your career and your organization. Please help me in welcoming Dr. David Ricketts. I got to tell you, I am super excited. Not because of what Bill Gates is going to say, but because of what Greg is going to do. I just walked across Harvard Yard, and it was a warm February afternoon. Now, warm for Boston would be summer compared to what Jeff just mentioned, but for everybody down here in Florida, warm just means it's going to get above freezing. And I was with my friend Paul, and we were on our way to Lowell Auditorium to hear Bill Gates speak. And I remember Paul and I, we walked in, and we wanted to see the auditorium, so we chose a seat off to the side. Now, these were bleacher seats, not like you'd have in a gymnasium, these were old wooden fold-down seats that had been polished to a sheen by the thousands of students that had come before us. And as Paul and I settled down into there, I looked out, and in front of me were hundreds of Harvard students, faculty, deans, press, all here to see what Bill Gates had to say. Dean Venke strode up on stage. Welcome, everyone. And he started to tell us about how he was trying to change Harvard. Bill Gates was at Harvard at a time when innovation and entrepreneurship wasn't proactively encouraged or at least even tolerated. And he wanted to change that. And that's why he created the Technology and Entrepreneurship Center at Harvard with my friend Paul. And he was looking for the audience to learn from Bill Gates about innovation so that they could be an innovator and an entrepreneur. And I remember there's one line Venke said that stuck with me. At the very end, he looked out at the audience and he said, you know, Bill Gates spent just as much time at Harvard as he needed to. For many of you, it's gonna take a little bit longer. <laughs> Dean Venke drove off, uh, walked off stage and Bill Gates came out and he started to tell us stories. Stories about his freshman dorm and how he consulted for the top companies in Boston. And he was so sought after they were flying the corporate, jet, the corporate helicopters in to pick him up from Cambridge, Massachusetts. He made more money in his dorm room than the graduates across the river in the business school did when they graduated. He even shared with us that day that he had to remember to bring $500 cash, which he had in his back pocket, because he was going to play Warren Buffett that evening in poker. Apparently, Buffett doesn't take credit from Gates. And as Bill uh, Gates was finishing his talk, I kept on thinking to myself, where's Greg? See, Greg is a student in our innovation course, and um, he had a great new idea for a company, and he thought Bill Gates was the perfect backer for his venture. And somehow he had gotten it into his head that the time to pitch Bill Gates was at the talk. All the faculty, all the students, all the security, that was the right time to pitch him. Now, I don't know if you know Harvard students. Um, some say they're a bit, er well, maybe confident. It's probably a better word, I think. But to pitch Bill Gates at a live event was beyond anything that I had ever expected. And as Bill Gates was waving to a standing ovation, I saw Greg down at the corner. He was wiggling his way in between the students, and I realized what he'd planned. He was going to bust the line and intercept Bill Gates on his way off the podium. Bill Gates did a final wave and started to walk off. Good day, Mr. Gates. That was a fabulous talk. I have something here for you I know you're going to love. No lie. He just busted out through the line and handed Bill Gates a proposal. Now, what do you think Bill Gates did? 
Um, thank, thank you, son. What's your name, Greg? Uh, thanks. Um, sure, sure, I'll, I'll take a look. He took it. It was just that simple. Greg had pitched Bill Gates at that talk with his brand new idea. Now, how many times do you think Bill Gates has pitched in an hour? A dozen? A hundred? And what happened next was classic. Bill Gates, after finishing shaking his hand, took one step forward, handed the proposal to his assistant, gone forever. Greg never heard from Bill Gates again. Paul and I were talking at the end of the talk about how amazing it was that he had stepped out, met Bill Gates, handed off his proposal. We felt bad for Greg that he lost it. And as we were walking out, I was thinking about that line Venky had said about how Bill Gates had spent just as much time at Harvard as he needed to. And as we were exiting the door, I didn't even see him standing there. Right there was Mark Zuckerberg. The entire time Bill Gates was teaching us about innovation, the entire time Dean Venke was talking about how he was looking for the next great breakthrough, the next student from Harvard that would be in the same path as Bill Gates. Everyone there wanted to see the next Bill Gates. He was in the room and no one saw him. No one. That is what so, is so difficult about innovation. It's about recognizing the seeds of innovation. Sure, it's easy after the fact to look back and say, wow, that was a brilliant idea. But what we need to do, what you need to do, is recognize those seeds of innovations before they blossom so that you can capture it and also so that you can create it. What I'd like to do with you this short time this morning is just talk to you a little bit about what innovation really looks like because I think often we don't realize where the true innovations are. So does anybody know what $20 billion looks like? 20 billion, that's a lot of money, right? Well, I have it here. This is $20 billion. Does anybody recognize it, maybe a little far off? It's the remote from the Nintendo Wii. In 2008, Nintendo had sold $20 billion worth of Nintendo Wii consoles. All because of this technology? No. In fact, Nintendo did not even invent the technology. This was invented by a private pilot who um, was inspired by gyroscopes and airplanes and thought about a way to control computer screens using a gyroscope. And his business partners had told him that the game console industry was the perfect place to sell his technology. I mean, you got to stop and think about it. As a scientist and an engineer, this is cool. Everybody's going to want to buy this. This is an innovation. He got an appointment with Sony, number one game console manufacturer in the world. He flew over to Japan, he gave his pitch. Sony's reaction, eh, not really interested. $20 billion. He then got an appointment with Microsoft. He actually had a phone call with Steve Ballmer who set him up an appointment with the engineers in Redmond, Washington to go pitch this amazing technology. Who better than engineers to understand that this is an innovation? He went there, gave the same talk about this great new technology, and do you know what Microsoft said? And I quote, that's a stupid idea. Literally, stupid, $20 billion. So Tom and his, um, his colleagues realized they needed to do something, and so they were going to go talk to the third place uh, company in the market, Nintendo. Now, I want to put this in perspective. Sony was the Apple of the day. Microsoft was the Samsung of the day. And Nintendo was the BlackBerry. How many of you out here still have a BlackBerry on you? Is anybody? No hands. Nintendo wasn't just third, they were a distant third. They were like BlackBerry a decade earlier. They had been number one in the 80s and 90s because of the brilliant, brilliant mind of Shigeru Miyamoto. Shigeru Miyamoto was affectionately called the Walt Disney of games. In 1980, when I was growing up with my two brothers, we were more likely to recognize Mario than we were Mickey Mouse. Mario Brothers was that popular. But with Sony and Microsoft entering the game, technology giants, Nintendo couldn't keep up. Sort of like BlackBerry struggling now to figure out what's next for them with someone like Samsung and Apple. And they were trying to figure out what's next. How do we innovate? And they thought about it a little bit differently. Miyamoto and his team were thinking about who are we not selling to? I want you to take a moment and think about this. Who are your non-customers? 
Now, I'm not talking about people who buy from your competitors. I'm talking about people who don't buy your products. Who are they? And his team started to think about, well, who doesn't play video games? Well, um, my daughter, Julia, she's five. She's a little short for age. She has pink rim, rim glasses, and she's not interested in video games. If it's not a cartoon of My Little Pony or Doc McStuffin, she has no interest. Um, as a dad, I don't watch play video games. And as a mom, I don't know how many moms we have here, but uh, I grew up in the 80s, two brothers, and we were not the best behaved kids. And I cannot imagine my mother taking care of the three of us and everything else in the family, wanting or having time to play a video game. But wait a second. What if you could get mom to play a video game? Well, if mom did play a video game, I, I guarantee you dad would be playing with her because I would not be able to get to go someplace else. Mom would play, dad would play, Julia would play. The whole family would play if you could just get mom to play a video game. But how? Tom came and gave his pitch about this great new technology, the same pitch he had given to Sony, who said, eh. The same pitch that Microsoft had said, you're stupid. And at the end of his speech, as he was talking about the technology, Miyamoto wasn't looking at a wand or an idea. Miyamoto saw a bowling ball. And he realized that was exactly how they could get mom to play. Two years later, Nintendo beat out Sony. Imagine if in 2018, BlackBerry was the number one company in the world. That's what Nintendo had done. By 2008, $20 billion had been made. How did they do it? We think about all this great technology, but that wasn't where the innovation was. This is the solution. This is the problem Sony and Microsoft were looking at a solution and saying, does that solve our problems? Does that solve our customers' problems? We don't know how this helps us. That is not what Nintendo asked. Nintendo asked, what if you could get mom to play the video game? Imagine the possibilities. $20 billion. I have another popular item here that is also sold billions and billions of dollars. Everybody familiar with this? This is an iPod Nano, but you can think of it as an MP3 player. Um, I haven't done the totals, but I know there's been billions of dollars of sales of the hardware and billions of dollars of the music that's been downloaded on these. Where is the innovation here in the MP3 player or the iPod? Is it in the sleek packaging? As a technologist, I just assumed it was in the hard drive. We finally made this great little small hard drive. Or maybe it's in this, this little round wheel that Apple patented. Or those iconic white headphones, right? But none of that, none of that had to do with the billion dollar innovation that made this possible. And to help you understand where that innovation is, I just want to ask you um, to bear with me. You've recognized this. I want to see how many of you recognize this. Now, you, you laugh, but when I do this to my students at Harvard, um, they come up afterwards and say, yeah, we recognize it, but we never actually bought one with music on it. So uh, this is a one gigabyte iPod. Does anybody know how many songs this holds? Uh, the one gigabyte's a little bit smaller, so it's more like 100 to 200. We'll average it out and say about 150. Still 10 hours worth of music. How many songs were on a CD for those of us that remember having audio CDs? 74 minutes, it's about 12 songs, maybe 14. Let's just make the math easy and say 15, right? 15 songs, 150 songs. The innovation was obviously in the hard drive because we can fit 10 of these in one of these, right? I see some head shaking. This is one gigabyte. Does anybody know how much data one CD is? It's 0.7 gigabytes. You don't have to be a mathematician. Seven tenths into one, one of these fits inside of this. That is the innovation. See, around 2000, what was happening is people loved the digital music that were on these CDs. But who here had a modem? Do you remember the modem? If you had AOL, you remember logging on, downloading your email. Do you remember how long it took to even get the, the smallest picture to come up? In 2000, on my modem, it would take 30 minutes to download a song or upload a song, 30 minutes. My modem connection never lasted that long. My brother would pick up the phone within an hour and I'd lose all my data, right? 
So somebody asked the question, what if I could shrink the digital data on a CD to a size that was so small that I could share it with everyone? Imagine the possibilities. They didn't need a brand new technology. Actually, the technology to do that has been around for over 100 years. It's called psychoacoustics. And I can explain psychoacoustics best by Imagine you're standing on the street with your friend Keisha and you're having a conversation about where you're going to go to lunch and a truck rolls by. Well, I, I can't hear what Keisha's saying when the truck is rolling by. But after the truck is gone, I still can't hear. Even if I have perfect ears that can hear all the tones we're taught is what we should be able to hear, the ear can't respond. If there's a loud sound, it can't hear soft sounds. If there's two tones close together, it can't hear them both. And if you take out everything we can't hear, you can shrink this down by over 90%. That encoding technique is called the MP3 encoder. The MP3 encoder was the innovation that allows us to put 10 of these into one of these, even though it shouldn't really fit. Where did that billion dollar idea came from? It came from that simple question. What if I could shrink the digital size of this to such a small size that I can share it with everyone. Imagine the possibilities. I have one uh, last technology example I want to share with you. This one's kind of fun. Recognize this? So who invented this? Joseph Swan, right? How many of you thought Edison? Okay, quite a few. Swan was an uh, uh, outstanding chemist in England, and he had uh, been looking at a way to build a filament that would shine when you passed electricity through it. And he worked hard in a scientific manner. He looked at materials, he did experiments, he took notes, and he made the perfect filament. Thomas Edison, who we all know as an amazing innovator, he also built a light bulb. Turns out his light bulb wasn't very good, though. In fact, Thomas Edison's patent was denied by the patent office because it was too close to all the previous work that was done. Thomas Edison spent, uh, if you've heard the stories, thousands and thousands of iterations trying to find a filament that'll work. So why is it that we all remember Thomas Edison as the great innovator? And I'm quite certain none of you know who Joseph Swan is. It's because Joseph Swan was asking the question, how do I make a light bulb? That's not what Thomas Edison was asking. He said, what if I could light New York City at night? Imagine the possibilities. In all these three examples, the seed of innovation came from, not from a technology, it came from that simple question, what if? Innovation is about possibility. It's about seeing and believing and envisioning new possibilities. That is where the innovation lies. This is the how. Don't ask how, ask what if. And I've talked to you about three technologies. I want to leave you with one last example of an innovation that's one of my favorite because of its impact and because of its simplicity. So I've kept it in the bag here so I can tell you a little bit about it before I show you. Um, this product has been number one for over eight decades in its market. In Canada, it's the number one product in its category. Now, I think they sell about a half a billion dollars worth of this product every year. I want you to think about your businesses or your services. If you sold a product for half a billion dollars a year that was a number one seller for eight decades, that would be awesome, right? That would be awesome. That would be an innovation. So what is this eight decade old leading innovation? You've probably already guessed it by now. It's Kraft macaroni and cheese. For those of you that are from Canada, you know that uh, they even removed the macaroni. It's just called the Kraft Dinner. It's the number one seller in the grocery store, and I believe it's been called the de facto national dish of Canada. It's so popular. <laughs> My daughter eats pounds of this a week. She loves it. So where did Kraft macaroni and cheese come from? Where was the innovation in this? Well, it all started in St. Louis, Missouri. 
actually before that, it started with the, the Kraft Foods Company, and, and their, their goal, their technology, was to preserve cheese, specifically cheddar cheese. And they invented a technique to can it, which had worked well in the 20s. But in the early 30s, they wanted to get it better. They wanted to transport it, make it cheaper, stay longer on the shelves. And they had invented the world's first powdered cheddar cheese. Now I'm talking about dry, chalky, pale yellow granules. I don't know if you've ever tasted it, but it tastes like cheddar-flavored dust. And this was the great new technology. As a scientist, I love it. This is perfect. It's going to stay. It's going to be easy to transport. But who wants powdered cheddar cheese? The marketing department did what I would do, and I think what many people would do. They went off with a marketing campaign on how to sell this new technology. They tried to figure out how can we solve our customers' problems with this brand new technology that we've invented. Now, they didn't have Facebook or Twitter at the time, so they did what they could do. They did newsprint ads, and they printed out recipes that taught homemakers to put it in casseroles and soups to taste better. But nobody was buying that, literally. Nobody wanted powdered cheddar cheese. Until a gentleman salesperson was headed to St. Louis, Missouri, as I mentioned, to give uh, his setup in the grocery stores. And so what he would do, he'd go into a grocery store and he'd set up a card table and he'd pull out his packets of cheddar cheese. Now I have one right here. That's pretty sexy packaging, isn't it? Right? He put it on the card table and behind it, he had the Kraft Foods logo and um, had the recipes that he put behind. And as he was finishing his setup, he stood back. People don't want powdered cheddar cheese. It doesn't taste good. People don't want another ingredient. People don't have time. This is the depression. People just want a good meal and cheap. What if I could give them a great tasting meal that dad could make in 10 minutes for his daughter, Julia, and cost only a dime. Imagine the possibilities. He walked back into the pasta aisle, and he rummaged around a bit, and he pulled out this, a simple box of macaroni. He took his packet of cheese, and then finally comes, I know you're waiting for the technology that makes all this happen, the brilliant innovation is this. He took a rubber band, rubber banded down and sat it there. Instantly a top seller. Number one for 80 years. How? How was he able to recognize this innovation? It's because he asked that question, what if I gave you a cheap, great tasting meal? And how did he make it? And I think this is one of the most profound simplicities of innovation. He did it with this. Innovation, simply put, is about making connections. If you look in your bag uh, later today, you'll notice that I've given you all a rubber band. On one side, uh, it has my webpage. If you're uh, not sleeping at night and want to learn about innovation, you can go there and it has my Harvard lectures. But on the outside, I want to leave you with this thought. It's written here on this simple rubber band. Don't ask how. Ask what if, and imagine the possibilities. And as I look out here at these leaders here in Bradenton, I think back to Lowell Hall when I was sitting there looking at it over the students. And I gotta tell you, I am so excited to see what you're going to do next. Thank you.